Daniela Ovadia, um, co-director of the uh, Neuroscience and Society Lab at the University of uh, Padilla. Uh, Daniela has a medical and neuroscience background. She's also a science journalist and a science communicator, specialized in public involvement and participatory processes on contro controversial issues related to science. Uh, she works as a consultant in ethics and neuroscience since 2008, and uh, for many institutions and universities in Italy and abroad. Um, she took part into EU projects in the field of ethics, uh, responsible research and innovation, and ethics management. She um, has also been involved in the in the, the one of the in uh, APP info of ICT platforms, the medical informatic platform. What's my uh, involvement in the medical informatic platform of the Human Realm Project? As uh, Karen told, I'm the co-director of the Neuroscience and Society Lab at University of Pavia. The director of the lab is Professor Gabriela Bottini. She's also the director of the clinical neuropsychology department at Ospedale Niguarda, which is one of the biggest Italian hospitals. Um, Ospedale Niguarda is a huge hospital in Milan. As you see, we have around 1,000 beds and we have uh, around 2 um, million and a half uh, outpatient uh, visits per year. So we have huge uh, databases and records. Um, our hospital was, uh, we are consultants uh, as university for ethical issues uh, for Niguada Hospital and the hospital was involved since the beginning in the uh, medical informatic platform. Um, I think it's important uh, if uh, we have uh, people uh, listening to us that are not directly involved in the Human Brain Project to explain a little bit how the platform uh, works. Um, and how an hospital can join it. Our hospital joined what was called the Federated Network of Hospitals and Centers, that is actually the initial medical informatic uh, platform of the Human Brain Project. It's part of the sub-project eight. Um, each hospital contributes with the data available to the network, uh, sharing clinical data and research data. And in theory, we will also benefit from the large amount of data available through the platform. Um, how does it work? Uh, we have what is called a local data mirror that has been created. So that seems uh, we have a server where our data are uh, stored in Niguarda Hospital, and uh, we um, uh, share there all the data we have on patients with diseases of the brain of all types, that means neurological and also psychiatric. Uh, the local data mirror is uh, connected to a general server of the platform that runs three software packages. What uh, the so-called federation and integration client, I will describe it a little bit more later, and the a query execution engine, which is a sort of Google to share uh, the data and to uh, send queries to the system, and of course an interface to use it. What will the platform do? Uh, what we hope the platform will do will be to visualize the type of data that are available in the network and uh, um, provide them to a user through a website. That means that a user can formulate a query to the system. I Just to give you an example, how many patients with Alzheimer's disease have um, uh, a specific genetic pattern in the available data set? This is the kind of question that a user can ask. Um, so uh, the user expressed the query and to what's called the federation client, which is the server, and the client rewrites the query in a set of sub-queries that is directed to the nodes of the network. This is a very important step in, in, uh, that reflects also, that has also implications for the informed consent. And after receiving all such sub-queries from the interrogated nodes, the federation client composes them, provides the visualization to the user, uh, a summary, and sometimes also statistical facilities, and send back what we call interpretable answers to the user. To the user. So the results are sent back in what is called an aggregate form. Aggregate form means that we don't know and we are unable as a user to uh, disaggregate the data into the single data that composes the results. 
Um, this is a um, picture I took from an article uh, written by Richard Krakowia and Larry Markham and published in Philosophical Transaction of the Royal Society. And it represents a, a sort of small exercise that uh, uh, reflects what you can do with such kind of platform. This uh, figure represents the subgroups of individuals of advanced age that have, and the red dots are the uh, individual that have uh, cognitive symptoms and the blue uh, are the ones that don't have uh, um, cognitive symptoms. Uh, this uh, uh, representation comes out from a data set that contains clinical imaging, proteomic, uh, cerebrospinal fluid proteins, genotyping of a large number of patients from three different hospitals. So what we can uh, have from this kind of data set, uh, in, uh, if we, mm, we do an exercise of data mining, is to understand, uh, let's say, how many Alzheimer's patients have also genetic modification or how many patients without cognitive impairment have the same genetic modification that we see in Alzheimer's and so on with the, uh, many, many parameters. So you can understand how powerful is this tool to reshape our diagnostic criteria in many diseases. Um, there are some data protections that were uh, data protection um, uh, tools that were implemented within the system. The first one is that the clinical data will be depersonalized and anonymized at the hospital. I mean, no personalized data will leave our hospital and all the data will reside on memory disks that are installed only for this purpose and will remain under the IT management of each center that is involved in the platform. At no stage, um, data on an individual level will leave the firewall that protects each center. So it will be impossible to reconstitute the uh, whole set of data of an individual. And the, the, the other important thing is that the aggregation of data into sub-answers, the reason why a query is divided into sub-queries and is recomposing sub-answers that are uh, provided at the end, is that uh, it's another protection that offers an opportunity to encrypt the data. Um, the legal reference for data protection in the EU, we discussed this uh, in a previous presentation. Of course, we have the EU Data Protection Directive, uh, an opinion on the e-privacy directive that is the, uh, was expressed in 2013. We have, of course, the national legal frameworks related to the nationality of the research partners. But we, on top of this, we have the new regulation of the European Parliament, the one that uh, was uh, mentioned before, that will come into uh, uh, that will uh, be used since May 2018. Uh, I think it's important to go back to some definition in this uh, regulation. The first one is the definition of personal data, that is any information relating to an identify or identifiable natural person. Um, that, and I think that, as you can imagine, the original data that we have on our platform are, without any doubt, personal data. Uh, there are also a definition of what we in, intend by processing personal data. That means uh, collecting, recording, organizing, uh, uh, adapting, uh, consulting those data. Uh, and of course, there is also uh, the transmission of the data and the dissemination of the data. So again, we uh, surely uh, the platform uh, undergo um, uh, um, will undergo under this uh, new regulation. And we also have an issue of profiling. That means that uh, under the new regulation, profiling is defined as any form of automated processing of personal data to evaluate certain personal aspects related to a natural person, and in particular to analyze or predict aspects concerning and health is ex explicitly, explicitly mentioned. So. Again, we are uh, under this definition. So what are the relevant issues for the informed consent? I would say that in terms of informed consent as intended by the European and Italian law, the medical informatics platform requires the patient to give a general consent on the use of his or her medical records within the hospital. And this is because the data never leave the uh, firewall of the ICT of the hospital in uh, an identifiable 
um, uh, way. And this was, uh, let's say, an ICT tool that was developed exactly to avoid any issue of shared data, personal data. The general informed consent that each patient signs at the entry of our hospital in Italy provides such an authorization. Um, and as it is impossible because of the aggregate nature of the data to go back to the individual, uh, to the information on individual, no other specific consent is legally required in Italy. But ethics sometimes goes beyond the law. And uh, I was, uh, this is a citation from an article by Nicholas Rose published in Neuron in 2014. And he says that, of course, most patients who have been treated for psychiatric and neurological disorder in European hospitals have not given their informed consent for their record to be collated and mined in the way proposed by the Human Brain Project. So the, um, the question is, how can this data legitimately be used? And he answered that uh, the anonymization of the data would solve many of these problems, but I'm not sure that it will solve all the problem as we saw earlier. We also have a problem of data property. And again, I cite from the article by Nicholas Rose, the particularly concerns seem to be the possibility that the data could be sold to private corporation or exploited for profit rather than for the public good. And of course, there is a debate around this, but I think that it's important to share the last sentence. Two rather basic principles collide. Data is personal property to be protected for the good of the individual versus data as a potential public good to be used for the benefit of fellow citizens, the hundreds and thousands of them afflicted by brain disease. And an answer to this uh, um, two basic principles, to the collision between these two basic principles is, of course, included in the new regulation. But as ethicists, we should discuss if we uh, agree totally with the, what the new regulation and, and if we think that the legal framework uh, resolves any ethical issue. And finally, there are things that go far beyond the informed consent in my personal view. Uh, the, the question are: should every patient be informed about the final goal of the platform to reshape the classification of brain disease? I mean, what about the patient that has a psychiatric disease and wants to know what will be in the future, maybe the name or, or, the, or the, diagnose, the diagnosis of his disease. Should we inform the society about the possible impact of such a new classification of diseases in terms of number of diagnoses, therapies, and possible new stigma? We don't know what the result will be. Should we start asking every single patient in our hospital to give explicit consent to the use of his or data for data mining. This is also a question that, as an hospital, we are discussing if we have to ask for explicit consent. So those are my questions that I would like to share with the ethics community. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, maybe I, I can start there. Um, and, and picking up on, on your uh, final questions, um, with regards to the ethical acceptability, um, and, and for example, of data mining. Uh, so it's my understanding that the medical mathematics platform um, goes through ethics approval for um, the use of the data on a hospital per hospital basis. So they're, they're, um, they go, in your case, to, to, to your hospital's ethics committee and say, is it okay from your perspective uh, if we can use the data. And if, if the hospital ethics committee says no, then, then it's over. And at that point, the HPP will pull out um, and not, not go ahead. Um, so I, I was wondering, and, and that, of course, does not imply individual consent. So, so the hospital uh, ethics committee can then say, yes, for, for these purposes, you're allowed to do that. So I'd be interested in your view on the relationship between the, the hospital ethics committee um, and the individual patient. Do, do you think it's legitimate to take this um, approach that the hospital ethics committee actually makes the decision for the individual patient? Um, I think it's a very broad question. I don't think I have a final answer to this. It depends on what value we put before. I mean, it's exactly the clash between the uh, collective uh, uh, benefits that could derive from the use of those data and the individual uh, benefits. I would say that I would suggest some, let's call, sort of remedial action. I would like the whole Human Brain Project to provide 
a feedback to the society about uh, the use of this data and a, a broad sharing of, uh, uh, um, of, of the discoveries of this platform. I mean, uh, as, as I was saying, what if we uh, have a new classification for psychiatric disease that goes far beyond the DSM that we use now that, as you know, is, is deeply uh, discussed? because it's based on symptoms. Uh, I think that it's very, very important to bring back the benefits, not only to the medical community, but really to the society. Um, if, we, if we can't go back to the individual patient, at least we should organize something for the community that provide the, the, the data. And maybe even at our local hospital, we should uh, organize ongoing participatory activities to bring back uh, the results to the community. Of course, if we accept the fact that uh, the general benefit uh, has uh, a larger, uh, is more important than the individual one, but we have uh, many, I mean, we use those data for uh, economic reasons yet. I mean, our uh, regional uh, health service uh, goes, uh, to the goes to the data uh, set and uh, we have activities of data mining uh, to plan our uh, economic involvement in the in the health system for many for epidemiological reasons. So I would say that we have a lot of background, uh, solid background to decide that we can use them. But anyway, as I told, as I was saying, I think that it's important to bring back to the society the results. Yeah. That, that, by the way, it's probably worth mentioning. This is something that the uh, European Commission ethics reviewers have also raised on, on several occasions, um, that they would like to see a, a clearer feedback um, on, on the benefits of the project that goes back to the, the, the people, um, the data subjects, people that the data or originates from. If I, could, if I could suggest there as well, this is a point where um, the sort of political impact of the project comes out of the ethical concerns because as you mentioned it has the potential to change the way groups are seen um, mm -hmm. and to re-stigmatize or to newly stigmatize different groups um, so the openness carries that uh, sort of risk but at the same time it also helps to mitigate the idea of uh, commercial exploitation so if someone takes the data and somehow makes profit off it which uh, in in the stuff that DVK have done so far in the work that they've carried out, that's been a thing that's, that's alarmed a lot of citizens, the idea that their data could be used for profit. So the openness would help to mitigate that because if you if something's open and available, well, it, it, it's hard to profit from it, but at the same time, it's um, got these risks of stigma. So it, it, does, it shows this continuum between the research, the ethics, and, and the politics. Yes, in another way, I think it's very difficult to prevent any commercial use because if we uh, shape in a different way uh, the diagnosis of cognitive decline or any um, any kind of uh, uh, degenerative disease. Of course, pharmaceutical industries will be interested in knowing what are uh, the let's imagine the genetic patterns for the diagnosis, the imaging uh, uh, findings that defines a diagnosis uh, in a specific patient, and they will they will probably also. Uh, use their uh, start new research on the use of their drugs in specific subgroups. So it's very difficult, but on the other hand, it's exactly what we want. We want more drugs that work. We don't want drugs that are used without a solid uh, biological basis. So I think uh, uh, we should uh, really uh, explain to the society that uh, and there are also, uh, let's say, good uh, uh, way of using commercially uh, the results of basic research. This is the, an issue that we always have with basic research. Even when you identify a new genetic target for cancer, you have the same problem. The genetic target is identified in general by a nonprofit institution or a research center, and then it, it is used by a drug company to develop a treatment. So we should try to um, explain how and when a commercial use is beneficial and when we decide that it is not. 
I think that that one of the really difficult problems is that we can technically solve the issues about identification and sort of the individual harm that might come to people by their data being identified. But there are at least potentially projects where we have reason to believe that if we ask people, would you let your data be used for this, they would say no. Uh, and it might not be the whole population, 90% or 80% might be happy to participate, but we have good reason to believe that 20% or 10% wouldn't. So what do we do in those circumstances? It's difficult to see that it's something that can be mediated by an ethics committee. Should it take sort of how, how should it make, make its decision? Uh, I can't come up with a good example for what, how it could happen in your project, in the Human Brain Project, but I think we have a good example from Denmark for, from a couple of years ago, because in Denmark you can use uh, people's health data without their consent uh, and without ethics committee approval, and the Danish researcher uh, studied the uh, uh, link between the circumcision of boys and various childhood disorders, including autism. Uh, and it's fairly obvious that if the parents had been asked, would you let this person use your data for these specific things, at least some of them would have said no. Uh, partly because the researcher is a prominent uh, anti-circumcision uh, spokesman, apart from being a bona fide epidemiologist. So, who sort of how do we mediate those conflicts? That I think is a really difficult pro problem for research ethics. <clears throat> 